John chapter 1, verse 47 through 51. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Here we see that Jesus seeks us first. Jesus saw Nathanael. And because of this, we find Jesus. Right? We're the ones who's lost, right? Jesus is not the only one who's lost. We're the ones who's lost. Jesus puts himself out there so we can find him. So he's putting himself out there. He saw Nathaniel before Nathaniel saw him. Now here it says he was a real son of Israel, a man who is honest and with principle, one who is not like the hypocrites, like the religious leaders. Remember, the religious leaders did not accept Jesus. That's why Jesus said this was an Israelite indeed, meaning Jews, you know, they started off as being God's people. And since they rejected him, that's when salvation came to us, the Gentiles. All the Jews read the Old Testament. And, and Nathaniel, he could see, which we're going to see in the verses, he could see without a doubt that Jesus was the Messiah. In verse 48, Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now God had revealed to Jesus who Nathaniel was. God revealed that to Jesus. All right, and I'll show you why in a minute. Just like when Jesus told Peter, when they came to arrest him, Jesus told Peter, Satan wants to have you tonight. How did Jesus know that? God revealed it to him. Remember, separate, you need to remember that we need to separate Jesus' man from Jesus' God. So here, we're talking about Jesus' man. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Because he was a true Israelite, he recognized Jesus as being the Messiah. Like I said, as the Old Testament, te Old Testament teaches. And in verse 50, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. What Jesus is saying, you think just because I saw you under the fig tree that that was something? That's what he's telling Nathaniel. And he's telling Nathaniel, that isn't anything compared to what you're going to see. That's what he's telling him right here. Verse 51. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now that's part of the greater things, because he said it we, He said it in verse 50, greater things you'll see. Well, he tells them right in the next verse, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And there's many verses in the Bible where it speaks about the angels coming down on earth. Matthew 4, 11, Matthew 13, 41. Matthew 16, 27, Luke 24, 23, John 20, 12, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, Hebrews 1, 6. These are all verses talking about angels coming down on earth. So when he said, this is what you're going to see, this is what he was talking about. And these verses that I just gave you, those are all the verses where it talks about the angels. Also in the town of Canaan, where Nathaniel's hometown Jesus was going to perform 37 miracles right there in Nathaniel's hometown. But now we're going to go to John, chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. Verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Now this is Jesus speaking. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Did Jesus take any credit for the, for the things he did or said? Nope. Right here he said the Father. Even though he was God, come in the flesh. That's what the Bible says, right? John 1, 14. It says that God came down and became man. But as Jesus' man, he never used his God powers. When God came down and made himself flesh, once he made himself flesh, he did not use his God powers. He was 100% man. That's why here he's saying, everything I do or say is from my Father. And the verses that will back that up is Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It speaks about the Holy Spirit who gave Jesus the power of doing these signs and wonders and miracles according to God's will. I'm going to say it again. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, speaks about the Holy Spirit who gave Jesus the power of doing these signs and wonders and miracles according to God's will. Did, was it Jesus' will? We got, remember what I'm saying here. Remember what the, these verses are saying because they're going to hit us in a minute. According to God's will. That's what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. <clears throat> Jesus said, I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. This is Jesus saying that. I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. Jesus, 100% man. Verse 11. Believe me that I am, I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now before I go any further, when you see this in the King James where it says verily, verily, sometimes it just has one verily. Right here it has two. Verily, verily means, verily, one verily means this is important. Meditate on what you're about to read. When he, when he puts two verilies on there, this is a bomb. Be ready. So, verily, verily, not all his verses does he start that way, but the ones that he does, doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to the other verses, but Jesus is getting ready, he's getting ready to say something very important. He says, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. He that believeth on me, on Jesus the works that I do shall he do also talking about the Christian and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father now let's concentrate on what Jesus did first before we go to the greater works what did Jesus do well he walked on water Matthews 418 talks about he walked on water but now he says greater works than we're gonna do guess what Peter did the same thing in Matthews 14 29 he walked on water but then remember when he when he got off the boat and he walked on the water Jesus told him to come and Jesus Peter got off the boat and started walking but then Peter started watching looking at all the waves and the storm instead of keeping his eyes on the Lord you look at you look over here instead of over here you put your eyes on the world instead of Jesus you're gonna sink that's a great teaching in itself. Peter showed that. with He definitely showed it. He put his eyes on what was around him instead of what was in front of him, the Lord. But anyway, Jesus did it, and Peter did it. Jesus raised the dead. In John 11.43, he raised the dead. Well, Peter did it in Acts 9.40, which we're going to read about that. He cast out demons. In Luke 11.14, Jesus cast out demons. Well, and the apostles did it also in Acts 5.16. So these things that Jesus did, we can do them also. It's not that greater works, and let me just tell you right now, greater works doesn't mean that it's more powerful, that we're more powerful than Jesus. Let me get that out of the way right now, okay? It does not mean greater works, does not mean our, our power is going to be greater than his. We're going to do what Jesus did, and I just showed you right here. When Jesus was here on earth... He either laid hands on them, or he just spoke it. In Acts chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. Verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto him the sick, handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Again, you have preachers today. Who practiced this? You send them some money. Of course, everything is sending money. You don't have no preachers out there that they always say, you know, send a small gift or they'll even give you a price for fifty dollars, for a hundred dollars, whatever. But I've seen it. There's there's preachers out there who do this practice. They have the handkerchief or the or the apron. Well, they do that they do, do it today. Apparently, now listen, that's why when you read the Bible you got to read every word. I've told y'all over and over. Read every word. In verse 11, what did it say? This was a special, special miracle. Special means it was just this one time. Y'all got that? Y'all see that? Verse 11 says 
it was a special miracle. People leave that word out and they, they act like it's, well, it's one of the miracles. We can do it today. Well, no. The Lord said this is a special miracle. This is just going to happen one time. People miss that. In fact, if you, from here on, it never mentions this kind of miracle again, using, using an apron or a handkerchief. It never says, it never even brings it up again. There would be some people that would say Paul has the gift of healing. If this was being done today, people would, people would say Paul has the gift of healing, don't you think? Okay, well let me read some verses after Paul did this. Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. It talks about Paul sending his brother, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce his name right, but Epaphonistitis. <laughs> okay, <laughs> names in the, these names are hard to pronounce, okay? But anyway, he sent a brother, a Christian brother, who had been helping them with his ministry. And, he, and, and in this, these verses, it says he's sending them back sick. Paul is sending this brother back sick. In fact, his illness was was uh, almost killed him. The sickness he had almost killed him. And it almost killed him because he was doing the work of God. Read the verses. It shows that he was doing God's work, helping Paul. He was in the ministry doing God's work. And right here it says Paul sent him back sick. Now, if Paul was a, if he had the gift of healing, why didn't he heal this brother? Why didn't he heal him? He had, if he had the gift of healing, like people, like I said, if you read these verses up here, what I just read, you would think, well, Paul has the gift of healing. But right here, he didn't heal his brother. Not his brother, but a brother. You understand? He didn't give him a handkerchief. He didn't give him an apron. Or, you know, he, he was not healed. Paul did not heal him. Also, in 2 Timothy 4.20, Paul went to speak to Timothy in this book. In one of the cities, there were several cities that he visited with uh, Timothy. And in one of those cities, he visited him, and it says, Paul left... And here's another name, Trophimus. He left, yeah, he left <laughs> Troy, sick uh, at Maltrum, is a city. But anyway, Paul left this brother sick. He went over here, and there was a brother there sick, and he left his that brother sick also. Here's two places where Paul didn't do any healing. First, it was a special healing. That's why he had it. Second. He didn't hear from God to heal either one of these brothers. God did not tell him to heal these guys. God told him up on these other ones. God told him. The gift of healing is not a gift that one man carries and he can just go around healing. The gift of healing this is, is belongs to anyone. And it's, it's being taught different. I'm sorry, but it's being taught different. Not one man has a gift of healing. Because if he did... He should be in every hospital in the nation healing people. But it's not that way. You To get the gift of healing, you get a word from the Lord. You get a word from the Lord. The Lord will tell you, Jesse, I want you to go lay hands and heal her sickness. If he tells me that, I'm going to lay hands on her or just speak it and my sister's going to be healed. But I have to hear from the Lord. If I don't hear from the Lord, I can lay hands on you, anoint you with all, do all that stuff. Ain't nothing going to happen because I didn't hear from the Lord. But if I heard from the Lord, I guarantee you, you're going to be healed. But I got to make sure I hear from the Lord. So a person who has the gift is a person who hears from the Lord first. It's not he chooses who he wants to lay hands on. God speaks to the person first and say, this is what I want you to do. The problem with... What some of these preachers are doing <clears throat> to these people that are sick and maybe dying, before they run into one of these preachers, they're probably, they're, they're probably making peace with the Lord, and they're ready. I'm serious. A Christian, if they're dying, if they have a sickness unto death, I mean, I would. I would make sure I have my peace with God, and I would say, Lord, whenever you're ready. And I would be content with that. All right, I'd be content with anything the Lord tells me or go through, just like Job. But these guys come along and says the reason you're not healed is because you don't have enough faith. That's what they that's what they say. These preachers who say we we heal and everybody goes to their church and they lay hands on them and they push them back, 
they called it slain in the spirit. It just gets to me because, I mean, if we read our Bibles, we would be able to see if the man of, the preacher that's up there, if he's doing God's will. We should see it. If we read this, we should see it. Like I said, I'm 56 years old now. But I've been reading this Bible since I was 25 years old. The Lord has given me a little wisdom, okay? He's given me a little wisdom. And I can call these churches that do that wicked. They're wicked. There is a gift of healing. It is a gift. But the Lord gives it to you when He needs it. If I'm out on the highway and so there's a car wreck that just happened and the Lord wants to heal whatever person got hurt, and he says, Jesse, go lay hands on that person. At that time, at that, at that time, he's given me the gift to go heal this person. But then after that person's healed, that's it. I don't have the gift again unless he tells me to do it again. You, you understand what I'm saying? So now all these people who were content with the Lord, now they're not content with the Lord because some preacher told them, well, you, it's because of your faith. You don't have enough faith. Now they're all troubled and like, what am I doing wrong? Just like Job. These three guys, they didn't help Job. They made things worse. Now we're going to go to Acts chapter 9. We're going to read verses 30 through, 32 through 42. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt in Lydia. And there he found a certain man named Ananias, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Ananias, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt in Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. The Lord didn't heal Ananias <clears throat> for a reason. And that reason was because of verse 35. Ananias had this illness for eight years. And I'm sure people prayed for him for eight years. Prayed that the Lord would heal him. I'm sure he went to doctors to try to get healed from whatever, sick, from the palsy. I'm sure this was happening. But it was not God's will until eight years later. In verse 35, you can see verse 35 tells you why he waited so long. One, Eight years, by eight years, pretty much a lot of people know this guy has this sickness. You go that eight years with this sickness, a lot of people is going to know about it. But verse 35, and all that dwelt at Lydia and at these two places saw him and turned to the Lord. Many got saved from him getting healed. Now, he didn't know the Lord was using them that way. He didn't know that. But in, remember, God's ways is in our ways. God was using him. He didn't even know he was being used. But God didn't heal him for eight years just so this could happen right here. Many, many got saved from his healing. If we go through this, we start. if we had to go through what he did for eight years, we start asking ourselves, you know, what am I doing wrong? Is it me, Lord? Am I, do I have enough faith? You know, is it because I don't have enough faith? Well, I've already, I've already showed you that. That some, some men got healed with no faith. They had no faith. They had no faith because they didn't even know who Jesus was. I can show you that in the scriptures. God healed this man and he didn't even know who Jesus was. So when people come up to you and say you're not healed because you don't have enough faith, don't believe it. Don't believe it. And if I was you, I'd even, I'd even ask him to leave. If he's in your house, I'd ask him to leave. Because a man of God would not do that. A man of God would not put you down and say, huh. It's because of you, God did this. or And there's places like that, that's if you're out of God's will, yes, you get chastised. But if you're walking with the Lord, and you have a sickness and you're not healed, it's not because you don't have enough faith. Faith has nothing to do with being healed. It all has to do with God's will. Even with Jesus said it, he did it in God's will. It was God's will that he healed these people. God's will. And that's why when we pray for, when I pray for someone who's sick, I pray. I say, Lord, I pray it's your will. I pray it's your will. Because that's the way it's going to happen. I can say, Lord, 
heal this person in the name of Jesus, you know, blah, blah. And, and I can even proclaim healness over this person. And they do that. you got men who do that. My real mother, I'm adopted. She was a diabetic. And she went to that church in Houston, that big church. They laid hands on her and they told her she was healed from her diabetes. So she got off her medicine. She got off her medicine and she almost went blind. So, you know, be careful who you listen to. Like I said, especially if they tell you, well, you're not healed because you don't have enough faith. Read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. If we would only read this, that's what's wrong, what's, what's wrong with Christians today. They're not reading this. They're not feeding themselves. And I've told you over and over, how strong are you going to be against temptations or other wolves out there? Because there's a lot of wolves out there. How strong are you going to be against them if you don't even read this? If you don't feed yourself on the Word of God, how are you going to know when there's a wolf in front of you? You're not. You have to read this. And this right here, this Bible study we have, praise God, praise God that y'all are here. Because y'all want to know. Y'all don't have to be here. Well, y'all have to be here because y'all live here. <laughs> but when it's at my house, they, whoever comes, they don't have to be there. They want to be here, be there. Because of this, they want to know what God says. Because there's a lot of wolves out there, and I'm showing you through this teaching right here, there's a lot of wolves out there, and they're saying things just like those guys from Job were saying things that were totally taking the Word of God, they were using it out of, they were not using the right motives. Verse 36, I'm going to read through 42. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple well named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorgas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Well, this woman, what it's saying here, she was she was doing God's will. She was doing good things for the Lord. Alms deeds meaning she was doing good deeds in God, in, in God's will. Like some men, we do it to show other men. But this lady, she was just doing God's will. She was doing all her good deeds for the Lord. Not for her glory, but for the Lord. Now remember that. This is what she was doing. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. Whom, when they had washed and laid her in the upper chamber, for as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him, weeping, and showing the coats of garments which she had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, turning him to the body, turning to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted up, lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Now let's see what all these verses said. We have to notice that in verse 34, in verse 34, Peter didn't pray. When he went to uh, Ananias, he just told Ananias, arise from the bed. It doesn't say anything about him praying. Right here, it says he, did, at, he didn't pray because the Lord had already given, what did I say? The Lord had already given him a word of knowledge. The Lord had already told him, I want you to go heal Ananias. So when he got there, he didn't have to pray again and say, Lord, do you want me to heal him? Lord, heal this man. He had heard he got a word from the Lord to heal him. God said, do this, and Peter did it. So he didn't pray with Ananias. But in verse 40, was it say that he, had to, he got on his knees and prayed? And why? Because the Lord hadn't told him anything about Tabitha. So he got on his knees and prayed. And the Lord spoke to him. And when the Lord spoke to him while he was praying, the Lord spoke to him. And he turned to her and said, Arise. So again, he got a word from the Lord. But this time he had to do the praying right there on the spot. 
But he got a word from the Lord, and so he told her, Arise. He didn't have to lay hands on her or Ananias. The reason I'm showing this, there are no formulas to pray for sick people. People are doing it all the time. They're doing it all the time. All these formulas that we've read, and in the gift of healing, the teaching I did on that, I've read of other formulas about the pool. Whoever went into the pool, they would get healed. All these, if you read the chapter, you'll understand why it happened that way at that time. But people are taking those things that happened right then and there, back then, and they're still carrying them on for today. There are no formulas in the Bible. Right here, there was no... What did Peter do? All he did was pray. He didn't go get a handkerchief. He didn't go get an apron. He didn't go put her in a pool. He didn't anoint her with oil. All he did was pray. And what happened? So was there any formula he did besides pray to the Lord? And I'm sure his prayer was, Lord, if it be your will. I'm sure he prayed that. Because Jesus did the same thing. These men on TV, or people that you've heard, the laying on of hands of people, and they're falling backwards. Where is that in the Bible? It's just not in here. And why people accept that, why they go to these churches and accept that, and I don't understand. I don't understand. That's, everything we need to know on the truth is right here. It's right here. Everything. There is nothing in this world that we're going to be confronted with that the Lord has not told us how to handle it in here. Everything, whatever we go through in life, doesn't matter what it is, the answer is in here. We just need to read it. Verse 42, And many believers, and many believed in the Lord. Many believed in the Lord. That uh, Many times in the Bible, that's why the Lord uh, healed people, even if even lost people. So people would believe. Did it say many believed Peter? Because he's the one who did it, right? Did it say they believed in Peter? No, it says they believed in the Lord. How many men today, if they did that, would take the glory? Oh, I got the gift of healing. You know, I laid my hands on her and she was healed. How many men would do that today? Now, what is greater works? Jesus reached, he reached people in and around Israel. Greater works to which Jesus referred were not greater in power like I said. Us. Jesus was just one man. He was just one man. But he gave that power to us. And who are we? Christians. Christians. What does Christians mean? We're Christ-like. So whatever Jesus did, and I showed you how the disciples did, whatever Jesus did, they did. So right here, the greater works is not the power. I mean, healing is healing, right? If you raise someone from the dead, how much more powerful can you get than that? So it wasn't the power he was talking about. It was the area. He says, now I'm going to go to the Father and I'm going to come back to you and live in you in the Holy Spirit, Jesus. So now Jesus is in every born-again Christian. So that's why he said greater works we're going to do because Jesus, as a man, was limited to an area. But now Jesus lives in us. Now we're going to do greater works than him because now he's using all of us. You understand? That's the greater works. Men of God, like Peter, they're the ones that are out there reaching the world. Men of God. Men who are not ashamed of the gospel. I'm sorry, but I've said it over and over. Christians are ashamed of the gospel. Christians hide their Christianity. They do not let their light shine. Why? Because they want to be accepted. And I've told you over and over, being a Christian is not a... You are not going to be popular being a Christian. Because why? Because the Lord says we're not of this world. This is not our home. This world is not our home. So we're not going to be popular here. People who live like lost, like the world, that's the people who are going to be popular because this is their place. This is not our place. We are not going to be po- we're, we're going to be popular in heaven. That's where we're going to be popular because then we're going to be with our people. But right now, lost people because the world is evil continually. That's what the Bible says. So the lost people, they're in a world that's evil continually. So they're going to be popular because this is their world. 
if you want to be popular with your friends and be accepted, then you can pretty much forget about living for the Lord. But when we let our light shine, and Christians don't, you get a run amongst friends or even family. Even family. They don't say nothing. They don't want to offend anybody. Oh my gosh. That is the biggest lie from the devil I've ever heard. Oh, I don't want to offend. You don't want to offend them. Well, because I'm not offending them, they're going straight to hell. Do you hear me? Because the person, the born again Christian, is not telling her or his sister or mother or father or cousin, uncle, aunt, whatever. They're not saying nothing to them because. Oh, I don't want to offend them. Well, because you're not offending them, guess where they're going? Because you're not giving them the light. Do you hear me what I'm saying? That's why I say, if lost people, if that doesn't burden you, then you better check your heart out. One, it's not in the right place with the Lord. Or two, you're so weak in your Christianity, you listen to the lies of the devil. Oh, you can't tell him nothing or her. Oh, you don't want to offend them. Or you don't know what the Bible says. How are you going to go tell them something? Christians are very, we're very weak in that area. Look, go, look at the churches. There's a lot of people in church. If, and they're not, but if these churches were all born again Christians in there, why don't we have more people getting saved? Because they're keeping it to themselves. They're keeping it inside that building. Inside that building, that's when they're Christian. But outside the building, and that's our ministry. The Lord gave us that ministry to go tell others about Jesus. He has given everyone that says you're born again, everyone that is a born again Christian has the ministry of reconciliation. Everyone who's born again. Now there's different ministries for different people, but this one ministry, all of us have it. To tell people about Jesus. And we're doing a very sad job of it. I read you in the Bible that they had church all night. Do we have church all night now? If the pastor's not through by 12 o'clock, people are already getting mad. Morning church, people are getting mad. Hey, we're only supposed to be here from 10 to 12 or whatever. Or at night from 7 to 8 or whatever hours the church has. Whatever time it's supposed to be over, people are looking at their watches. They're going, okay, come on. I'm serious. But in the Bible, they had church all night. And what, did, what does the Bible say? That people were getting saved daily. Why? Because people were hungry. Look at this Bible study. How many people, hungry people we have here? And I tell a lot of people about my Bible study. And I'm sure y'all have too. But, but who's come? People are not hungry for this. They're not ready to stay up all night. That's why people are not getting saved daily. In other places he said, and he added to the church daily. That's because those people were serious about their walk with the Lord. If I'm coming down on Christians, it's only because that's the way Christians are. And I say Christians. I'm not talking about lost people acting like Christians. I'm talking about born again Christians. They get the Holy Spirit inside of them, but that's where it stays. They don't bring it out. So the power to, to perform these greater works would only be available because Jesus was the, was was going to go be with the Father, and it was only then that we that He would send. What did He say? The Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. He says, "I got to go to the Father, so I can come back as the Comforter, the Holy Spirit." And when I come back as the Holy Spirit, Acts 1.8, this is why he came back, to live in us. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This is why Jesus came back to live in us. So he would give us power through the Holy Spirit to witness about him. Now, this greater works, greater works did not mean that we're going to be more powerful. Greater works only means now Jesus can witness everywhere. Where there's Christians, he can witness there because he's living in that born-again Christian. Amen?